me pull the computer a little closer. Cool. That's good. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so what have you been up to in the lockdown? Oh, gosh, I've been busier than ever. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that, actually. Yeah, because I've been stuck at home, yeah. you know? <laughs> and um, so it's interesting. When the lockdown first hit, I, I got very... Um, kind of down i thought well there's no more playing no more clubs no more tours no more hanging and then there was this one friend of mine that um i had promised to help him with a song so we started trying to do it over facetime i've never been someone that likes to work like that i like to be in the same room hmm. we were working over facetime and then we kept working and then all of a sudden i realized oh I, you know this is good it's taking my mind off of the pandemic and everything and so I got busy. I picked out a song of mine that I hadn't finished, and I started working on it. I said email to somebody the file, and and I started getting comfortable working remotely. Nice. Yeah. Is that track released or? Oh yeah, the first track we did was Rocket Man, um, ah. and it came out. Yeah, I put it out. I put out a lot of stuff during the. Um, um, pandemic you know put out a lot of lot of we, we finally got into releasing one song a week one one oh, release nice. every week yeah yeah i um, heard your track is sweetness uh oh, and that was that's a really awesome track i really i really really like it thank you man thank you yeah. well you know uh backing up to the rocket man the one you're talking about the one that came out was the one with steve Picaro and hmm. um um Jason Chef, um, let me tell you, uh, go back here for a second. Sure. iTunes. Um, so we started, once I got the hang of it and figured out how to finish a song, we did um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Uh, yeah, about 15 nice. releases, uh, singles, and one full length. Oh, yeah, no, it's actually, no, more than that, actually, about almost 20 releases. Can you believe that? Wow. So is that all on Spotify and Apple Music and stuff, or? Exactly. I must have seen it when I when I checked you out on Spotify. Uh, I just didn't register that it was all this year. <laughs> yeah. No, because because it became a way to to keep the music going. See, normally in the old, I came up doing albums, you know, and we always, you know, I grew up in the '60s and in the '70s, everything was album oriented. And then what I've realized now, and I just turned 64. I've been doing this since I was 16, so mm. long time. But I realize now that we've shifted fundamentally away from albums. Right. People really are interested in it, and there's no, really no reason, because it's the way you, do, you used to deliver 12 songs at once on an album. Physically, you'd have to ship it or truck it or warehouse it. Now it's so different, and I, I like the way we do it now. You know? mm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely different than the old good old days, <laughs> for better well, or for worse. New good old days, because what I found was I took a song that I had already released on the album and re-released it hmm. as a single, and I got tremendous attention to it that was not paid when it was part of an album. Ah, that's pretty cool, actually. That's, I mean, that, that means you can do that for many, for more songs, hopefully. Get the same I thing do, going. That's what I'm doing every week. And, and, and But see, I, it, people don't want you to just can only re-release old stuff. Right. But I'm taking, like, for example, with Rocket Man, I took a new version of Rocket Man that I finished and I took the other versions that were out on the record. I put them all out together as a single, and it was quite nice. It, it's it's really that that's what gave me the um, inspiration to start putting out stuff every week. Right, that's cool, man. I mean, because you also have, uh, if I understood it correctly, you have your own record label. How do you pronounce it? Is it Creechy? Creechy. Creechy Records. And exactly. have, have have you always been independent or? Yeah, here's the way it all started out. You know, I came out to California um, when I was, uh, 
In fact, let me see if I can shift over here if you can see better. Yeah, sure, man. I think that might be better. Yeah, yeah that's better. Perfect. So I came back to California. Are you recording this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> I came out when I was 18, and I my goal was to get signed to a record label. I didn't really know how the record companies worked, but I saw it as this magical thing, like the movie studios with lots of money, perks, fame, fortune. You know, there, there's a real side to this business that a lot of people don't know about. And it's, it's like, it's a brutal truth is that not all artists always sell a lot of records and not all artists always put a lot of people in seats at concerts. <laughs> It's it's a very tricky thing, the popularity and to be relevant, you know, and uh, especially over. And then you can be for one period of time, but over a longer period of time. So, long story short, I made demos. I got I got called into the offices of Sony, um, Warner Brothers, different people, talking about records. It never ever really worked out. So it's just funny. Like, I ended up putting up my first record. Uh, through doing my own recordings on my own. So I started to learn how to record and produce and make the sound that I wanted. And I did that, got a deal with Japan. And quickly after that, I mean, I produced the first record, so I already produced from the beginning. But quite quickly after that, I was offered a label deal. Hmm. And when the label deal was to make eight records, and that was when we, that was called the Creechy label. That's, Creechy goes back to 1983. It's short for Creature. Right, right. My friend called me the creature. Right. <laughs> and um, another friend of mine, a bass player from Toto, Mike Picaro, one day he said, Creechy. And I said, oh, I like that. I don't like the creature, but I like Creechy. Why so are I you said, a creature in, in their eyes? Well, w w yeah, what's the origin? <laughs> well, when we were young and wild, you know, my friend Carlos Vega was my best friend. He was the drummer in, in my bands, and he went on to be very famous, and then he passed away tragically. But mm. Carlos, he made nicknames for everybody. He, he called me the creature. Creature. <laughs> it was a funny thing. Hey, creature, creature. Right. You know, and in Spanish, he'd say, la creatora, creatora. It was just a joke, <laughs> you know, because I was kind of wild. I had long, wild hair, and I had big, wild beard. And, oh, yeah. And I was out in California, like, looking to make it as a musician. It was kind of like wild and crazy guy. But, you know, I liked Creechy. Creechy, I said, I'm going to call my company Creechy. So I, you know, Creechy Productions, Creechy Records. Creechy is my is my email. Mm. It's the Creechy AOL, is if you want to write me, is my email. Um, I have Creech Tunes Music. And so long story short, um, that stuck, you know. People wow. call me. Most of my inner circle call me Creech or Creechy. I see. That's a, that's a cool nickname, man. <laughs> and it fits the label, I guess. It really did. And you know what? Creature is is something that's created. Mm. Creature comes from creation. And I'm very creative. And my, my handle is we make music. Right. That's my mission statement. Now, the long form of the mission statement is we write music, we record, we, re we rehearse music, we arrange music, we perform music, and we record music. Mm. But it's all part, if you simmer it down, we make music like, we start with nothing, and the end product is music that you can hear, mm. and you can see it performed. Right. That's or I might, mean. this Saturday I'm doing a live show on Zoom mm. from my house with uh, Steve Ferroni, the drummer from the Heartbreakers, James Harrow, wonderful guitarist, Jimmy Earl, the bass player from the Jimmy Kimmel show. We're going to be here right in the other room. Live concert is free. Cool. We ask for donations, but it's free, and that'll be three o'clock on Saturday. And the information is on davidgarfield.com. Nice, man. I'll definitely check that out. That's a, that's a cool. Because yeah. I haven't seen a Zoom concert during this this time at all, so I don't really know how it is. Is it good? Is it bad? It's really good. We we figured it out. It was kind of a process. I was never would never have tried anything like that, but my brother wanted. My brother had somebody do a concert for him, a private concert with guitar and sing right into the computer like this, blah, 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 you know. And then they asked me if I would do one on piano, and I thought, I like to have a little group. I have a setup in there with drums, and I have a drum set and bass. Let me see if I can get a little group. Then I thought, well, I have an interface. 
an odd little interface from the studio, an old one, M-Box. Let me hook that up and put up a few mics. And then I read up on how to adjust Zoom. There's a lot of settings in Zoom that you have to reset for music. Right. It's really set for dialogue. So I did all that. And then we did the first show. It was okay. But then we figured out, and now we have a full set of mics. Everything is mic'd up. There's wires all across the floor. And we're going into my studio room, into my mixer, my Mackie mixer, into my Apollo, which is what I use for Pro Tools. And then that goes, Apollo goes straight into Zoom. So it's, nice. and it's real. you can check it out. It's, it's actually sounding pretty good. Yeah, man, I would definitely check it out. That, that would be a cool experience. Um, but so, I mean, Something that's very interesting is, you know, when, when you started out, you said in L.A., when was that, the 70s then, or 60s? Yeah, it came out in 1974. I mean, how, how, how was that time for you then? Like, what, did you grow up in L.A., or what, did you come from outside of L.A.? No, I grew up in the East Coast and mm. the Midwest, but we right. spent time in both places, and I was really formative years in New York, so that was part of, in the 60s, like, they had Woodstock, Mm. was advertised on the radio when I was in grade school, sixth grade. I asked my mom, can you take me to Woodstock? I heard all the names, like, Jimi Hendrix, Santana, you know, they were running it down. I'm like, Carl, you still in there? Mom, can you take me there? I said, she said no. <laughs> Turned out that was like, nobody had ever done anything. It was like a mile of cars just stuck. But then they did the Band of Gypsies, Jimi Hendrix concert at the Fillmore mm. on New Year's Eve. It was recorded. It became that famous record. We were going to go to the concert, we, and they were sold out. Well, my friend's mom went. We were in junior high school. So I grew up in a very strong era of progressive rock and roll. I didn't really know jazz or like jazz. But then we moved back to the Midwest for high school, and I got – it was the jazz rock was happening in the 70s, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Chicago, Tower of Power started – there was this fusing of jazz and rock, and there were some prog rock bands in England that I quite liked. Even Jack Bruce from Cream had mm. some records that were with horn players, and I liked Jethro Tull. And so I, basically, I liked melodic stuff, and I liked improvising. I liked prog. So I get it to L.A. in 74, and I was kind of like, I had already played professionally in St. Louis, and I played R&B and jazz, and... Um, I get to L.A. Because in St. Louis, the rock thing wasn't very wasn't professional. I get to L.A. and I really wanted to get into jazz. You know, that was what I wanted to do. And at that time, you know, Chick Corea and, Re and Return of Forever, they had been out yeah. here. And uh, George Duke was out here, who I really liked. And um, Weather Report was out here. There was a lot. The Crusaders I really liked. So there was this whole L.A. jazz thing. But I was not that aware of the studio world, the session world, and that was really connected. And it turned out a lot of well, a lot of the great musicians were playing in the studio, to, and they were making a good living doing three sessions a day, and they didn't have to travel. So that was a big influence on me. Uh, the Picaro family, who who were in Toto, and um, guys like Emil Richards, who was one of the most recorded instrumentalist played on you know every record you could and tv show you could imagine but there was a whole world of people that played recording and but they played jazz as well there was always a synergy and when you find i'm kind of going off on a tangent when you find like you go on things like the wrecking crew and yeah, yeah. Stand status of motown and you'll find that all the backing musicians for um, recordings were always kind of jazz players because the jazz players had sensibilities how to fit this and how to fit that. And so, you know, jazz is at the bottom of everything. So I started out really with jazz, my passion, but then the 70s, so but you're asking me about what it was like in the 70s. It was really cool. <laughs> I got out here and there was lots of musicians and they were much more professional than where I from out in St. Louis and in the inner city and stuff. I played in bars. Right. You get out here and you had these guys and they had cool amplifiers and they had little special cars, square back, little lift backs they could put their equipment in or vans, right. rehearsal rooms and garages. Some people even had home recording things. But what was going on is people played. They said, let's get together and play. Let's get together and play. And they would play. And then in the daytime and then at nighttime, there was six night a week gigs. People played in restaurants or bars. Mm. 
So the whole scene of L.A., you go to any neighborhood restaurant and in the in the bar, there would be a band and they'd be there for like six weeks, six nights a week. And then they go they go from like the Red Onion in Pasadena for six weeks to the El Torito in San Bernardino for 12 weeks. And then they'd be at Charlie Brown's down in Newport Beach. And the bands all just crisscrossed around time. And there were a lot of musicians that played, you know, young Young up and coming get played in these bands and then they jam and they do a session here or there. Mm. And I got into that whole scene and I was really lucky. But how did you get into the scene? Like how did you get your first gig? Like was that playing live and or was it in the studio? How did you Yeah, what was really, your first break, I guess you can call it? It's really interesting. So I come out to LA and I knew a handful of people I had met. That it, I met them in St. Louis when they come through St. Louis, and I got their numbers, and I came out to LA, and I was calling them up, trying to connect with them. And when I came out to LA, the very I came out on a Thursday, and Sunday night I was playing. I was in a gig. What? <laughs> very lucky. I had a three night a week gig, but it was in Riverside, which to me was like driving back to Missouri. Riverside was an hour and a half drive back east, east of California. It was. But everything in L.A. is really vast. When, right. But my, I was uh, freaked out because I was looking for like a little center of every. I thought everything was centralized. L.A. is really spread out. It's mm -hmm. like completely spread out. There's all these different communities. And there were jazz clubs down in, in the beach, Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach, like the Lighthouse. And that was a completely different area. And then uh, North Hollywood, the Dante's, the Baked Potato. And then there was places every it was all these different scenes and pockets and not being growing up here i didn't really know now what's interesting is people that grew up in la they grew up in one neighborhood so they kind of see la from that view but i came from out of town so i i, I got into all the neighborhoods and i met people from here and there awesome. and so where what happened for me was i played this gig and the saxophone player in this band was amazing His name is Steve Tablioni. I don't know if you no, familiar yeah, with it. No. Well, he played in my band. He played in a band called Caldera. He ended up becoming one of the top studio guys. And all he does now is is movies for James Horner and James was it James uh, Newman? Al, no, who is it? Um, Randy Newman's brother. Right. Whoever that is, he's uh, he's one of the top. Thomas Newman. Thomas Newman. He's one of the top film films. So Steve has become like this amazing um, session guy. Mm. He does a very specialized thing with sound design. But he was on that gig. So that's where I started connecting with great musicians. And then after four weeks, was it four weeks of doing that every week? That came to a close. And then I was looking around. I mean, yeah, it was hard to find gigs. I remember... Um, I remember joining this one band and there was a band looking for a keyboard player so I joined this band they were kind of horrible <laughs> and they rehearsed in a way long drive and I'd drive, drive my friend of Rhodes out there and you know um, and then they never had any gigs and they finally had a gig and then the gig was in a really kind of a nothing place and so I thought oh this isn't really panning out but wow. that was like the lowest point that, that one and i think that was like if i'm not mistaken that was the first winner i was out then i met some guys who had friends of friends who had the guy had been out on tour with with the t1 of brass herb albert and he had been out of town he finally came back to town and i met him and his friend was in hollywood and he knew worked at a&m studios and knew people in the studio world and hmm. had worked ringo and you know right. jim kelp people from Sly and the Stone. And then I started to meet people on the Hollywood side of things in studios. And then I met a guy through him and asked me to do a recording session. It was my first recording session. And I remember being in the studio, trying to figure out how to play this thing and mix it. And they loved what I did. And it was like kind of like a beginning of a recording. Nice. Uh, see, you must have crossed paths with uh, Lee Sklar, for example. Um, oh sure yeah, yeah i mean and nathan nathan East, you play with him too right all the time nathan came to la in the um, late 70s or early 80s and i met him when he came to town we've been friends i've watched his whole growth as a musician but he started playing with me 
back in the 70s. And um, yeah, no, and Lee, Lee, I've known Lee and known of Lee, but I didn't get to work with Lee until the 90s ah, cool. when I hired him to play with me. And then he's played with me several times since. I've had yeah. him on the session. Yeah. yeah, I had both of them on the show a few weeks ago. Uh, really Together? cool guys, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah oh, uh, no, 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 separately. So, Nate, so Leland plays on my version of Red Baron ah, okay. that I did on, on, it's on Spotify yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, I saw that one, yeah. He played on the original with Billy Cobham. That's why I invited him to do it. So Nice. Well, he's amazing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very cool. I mean, how did you approach, you know, because getting hired for a session and stuff, how did you approach um, getting to the session and, and being able to do your best work, you know? Did you do a lot of preparation or did you show up and just see what people said? What was your approach to that thing? Back in the day, we just showed up. <laughs> I mean, the key was to be there on time, right. and I actually wasn't very good at that either. Oh, yeah? The John <laughs> Carl was a great example. He, he came to the session like an hour early. Oh, yeah? Got there and tuned his drums and just, you know, was into it. Like, I was the kind of guy that, I finally figured out how to be on time. I was the kind of guy that was always 15 minutes late, no matter what I did. And then I figured that out, so now the 15 minutes earlier. Right. But I would <laughs> I would plan on being there, say, um, half an hour early, and then I'd end up showing up five minutes before it started. But no, I mean it was a lot of energy with the sessions. Like you know, you get these guys come in their room: Jeff Picaro, Nathan East, Larry Carlton, Lenny Castro, myself, Tom Scott, or you know whoever. You come into the room. And there's all this energy that comes in, and you all feed off of each other. It's very much different when people work by themselves. I that's why I was so against that. I, you know, it's only become really relevant for me in the pandemic. You know. Yeah, I mean that's something that is missing today a lot. Writing music, it is a lot of one person does one track, and another guy comes in, lay down, lays down something else. It's a lot of uh, what do you call it? you just add layering essentially, rather than having live recordings in the studio you know um it's a shame because uh it's, it's there's cool. interaction and you you everybody kind of triggered everybody to be every, it was always like that like oh here i am who am i with today oh, i'm with i'm with harvey mason you know i'm with lee rittenauer i'm with tom scott you know and they would be talking stories telling jokes or playing doodling it was like there was like a thing like you know you you were on it was like being in a sports team, like being on the baseball team, you know, in your with other players, and it would you have to bring your best game, you know. Yeah, I mean, so could you get away with doing stuff with certain players that you couldn't do with others, like you know, inserting the funny licks here and there, or did that change it depending depends on, who, on who was producing? You right, know, right, right. some producers were extremely controlling of what you did; sure. others. You could kind of do what you wanted, but what I learned so there's a now you answer me an interesting question. I'll tell you something that's interesting. Mm. Um, the way it all worked is if you go into a session and you're all playing together, the key of the studio player back in I think in the '70s was not to do something that would obviously be wrong. <laughs> that was the real skill. Like you go into the session, there would be like let's say there's eight people. Everybody's got their music. You know, they have one mix. They're all listening to one mix. And you're playing. And the key was not to do something that would draw attention to yourself regardless. You know, if it was wrong or busy or out of context or just a mistake. So what happens is you get kind of a persona of playing the minimum. Like, you know, you're, not, you're just going to play what works or what you know. If you don't know something, you don't play it. And you kind of... And so... If the people that are running it don't hear anything or don't say anything, you're fine. <laughs> and that's the way it ran. Now, um, I am a guy that likes, in my years of producing, I love soloing. I started so sol I was into soloing shit because I'm a musician and I can hear every note. See, some engineers, they solo something to listen to the EQ. I solo something to listen to the notes and I can hear an accord. Oh, he's playing a D in that in that B major chord, I hear a D in there, you know. Now with polyphonic melodyne, 
I go in and fix the notes that right. I don't like. I mean, <laughs> right. kind of a nut like that. But back in the day, I would solo things, solo things. So now what I noticed is we're working on some songs. I don't want to mention names, but veteran studio players, I would solo their parts. And I would hear some stuff in their part that I didn't think was cool. But when you didn't solo it, you couldn't tell it was there. It was part of the groove. You know? Right. Right. So that's another thing. If it grooves and it sounds good together, don't fuck with it. But yeah. at the same time, it's very interesting to solo things because when you find out what's there, what isn't there, sometimes you can improve it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but this goes to my theory that this, like I said, this particular session guy, I realized that it was just about getting through the thing and making it feel good, but um, not drawing in the attention, not stopping and going, hey, David, I don't understand this chord. What's this? He would just, when it got there, he just wouldn't play it, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> and it was survival. You go into a session. Mm -hmm. People didn't didn't labor over things like they do now. And the mixes used to be done mm -hmm. just in several hours. It's mixed, it's done. Now you mix it, you take it home, you study it, you come back. I mean, I am so guilty of that. I'll get a mix. I'll say, my engineer will send me a mix. I, I love the mix. Now let me live with it. And as I live with it, there's 18 things I want to change, you know? Right. I mean, is that good or bad to you? Like, it's, yeah. What are your thoughts uh, on that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fine line because I'll tell you what, I've taken, I think it's good. I think it's good that, because I have a great relationship with my engineers now hmm. that they know they're going to do so many recalls with me, but it's not going to be crazy. Right, right. Not going to, but people can get emotional and it's like, Okay, turn the bass from back down. Okay, okay, no, turn it back up. You know, and they, and they want it done right then and there. The key is live with it, make your notes, come back to somebody. Don't come back to them every five minutes, but come back to them, you know, two or three times. In the last, okay, listen, let's try this. Now, my engineer is very happy to work with me on recalls, but you can go too much. You can get to the point where it, you're, you know. You it, lost it. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you an example. I made some broccoli the other night on the grill. <laughs> yeah. And it was, I put some nice soy sauce and vinegar for like a ponzu kind of thing and some seasonings and it was crunchy and it was tasting pretty good. And I said, well, let me leave it on a little longer. And it got too mushy. Right. And I put a little extra soy sauce on it. It was too salty and too mushy. Yeah. That can happen. <laughs> it makes it cool. But isn't that, you know, like that's also the secret to you know making great music I guess, and producing engineering records is to know when to stop because you know especially when it comes to, comes to mixing and if you're starting out it's easy to be like oh, i need to add all these plugins you know t for example uh, yeah but that, that's the key i think to stop you know, i don't good. use any plugins practically at all i don't i just try to make the music sound as best as it can as music and then i let the engineers mm -hmm. But what I've, what I've found interesting is that engineers, you know, there's one engineer in particular I've been working with, Mick Gazowski. Well, my oh, main, yeah. you know who Mick is? Yeah, he's really good. Uh, and then Steve Sykes is my main engineer. We've been working together. And he's, he's a wonderful engineer. He's a musician. He's very passionate about doing it right and goes to great lengths. And him and Mick are my two main guys. And the thing about Mick that's interesting is he was never a musician. He started out as an engineer. And he's engineer for him is like his instrument. And so when you give him a mix to start with, he'll come in, he'll spread the sounds in his own way, you know. And it's always quite delightful to hear, what's he going to do with this? And it's like, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a badass mixer. Uh, so it must be great to work with him. Yeah, he's wonderful. And, and he's... He's done probably a dozen of the songs. I mean, Al Schmidt's done a couple. Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, Mick's done about a dozen. Steve Sykes done 90%. And uh, there's a gentleman named J.J. Blair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've heard of J.J. Yeah, he was on the, on the show, too, actually, a few weeks ago, a month ago, maybe. So, well, J.J. did our did our mix of fame, and it came out wonderfully. So, And he'll be nice. doing more. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, he, he's a great guy, man. Really good. Really good guy. I'll have to tell him that I was on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He should do. Uh, he should know who I am. <laughs> I yeah. hope so. Uh, but something that's super interesting, because I've had 
other guests and some independent bands, like some cool rock bands and some producers, songwriters who, and when it comes to the discussion of record label or not, like being signed or being independent, because um, my point of view has always been, well, if you can be independent, be independent. Uh, and obviously you are independent too. So what, what do you feel is, is better being independent or gives you, does it give you more freedom as an artist and business owner? Absolutely. Absolutely. The independent is wonderful. It's just, there's more work involved, you sure. know, but you get to there's control more. where the money goes, I guess. Right. That's true. I mean, it's a very interesting situation we're in right now because the way I see it, the way to really be able to be sustainable, you know, really sustainable with your music, especially now with COVID, you know, is to, um, is to, you know, them get the maximum amount of streams, you know, hmm. I think that's what it boils down to. Like certain artists have a tremendous amount of streams and that will turn into a decent income. Yeah. But it's such a large number. Like, you know, I think, like I'm right now, I'm coming up towards about 2 million streams a year with my catalog, which sounds great. But if it was 200 streams hmm. or, I mean, I mean, 200 million right. or if it was 50 million, you know, that would be a quite a bit better. But isn't it also, you know, talking about streaming and stuff, it must be much better being having your own label because uh, if, if an artist, you might not see much of those two million streams at all because you get such a low cut. Oh, yeah. No, the way the artist deals always worked in this business was the artists, you know, they got 10 cents, 20 cents on a dollar. Yeah. But. The key is the record company is not even going to give you that dollar till they've recouped yeah, yeah, yeah. into it. Mm. And so, you know, when I came out here and I was learning about how the record business worked, it's, it's quite an interesting thing. You know, yeah, we'll put up a hundred thousand now back in the day, you know, we'll put up a hundred thousand or we'll put up $200,000, you know, for you, the, for the group to make a record and for some promotion and this, that money is going to come back. Whatever money is earned, it's going to come out of there. So you're never even going to see, you're never going to see one penny. And I'll tell you something. I've made a lot of deals over the years with licensing things of my catalog and got little advances and so forth, but uh, advance against royalties. I have never once seen anybody actually come back and pay the royalty. Right. Because most of the time, the sales seem to stop before. Oh, yeah? And then in one case, I, I went beyond that. But, the, but that's when you run into another issue where the people did not pay me. They tried to find a way to not pay me. It was, a, it was actually a scam. Yeah. But the point is, it's the nature of this business. It's, it's really insidious because... I, I have compassion. There's some people that have ripped me off. I spent I spent months chasing after people. There was a guy in Germany that put out some of my stuff on compilations of Weather Report and Steely Dan. And when it was all f done with no advance, it was supposed to be getting some kind of royalty. And and eventually he sold. Eventually he owed me. I even had the statements. He owed me the money. He even showed me the statements and showed me what he owed me. But he never paid me. Shit. And and I was so mad that I realized he couldn't pay me because a small small label they're doing something on jazz they think they're going to sell they have pat metheny or this that or that. but in reality the money they get is barely enough to keep their lights on or keep their rent paid and the real that's the cruel reality of music hmm. which is why i firmly believe i actually firmly believe that music should be subsidized i absolutely hmm. believe that hmm. i don't know if there's anything i can do to promote that we're in such a weird time in in, my, in the last 20 years, they, we have watched the Bush administration cut all kinds of artistic grants and it right. cuts music in the schools. And I mean, everything's just going down, down, down. But quite honestly, they spend so much money on so many other things. They would just have a minister of culture, like some countries have a minister of culture 
and within the ministry of culture, you know, spend money on music. I'm, I know, I'm, give give grants, give salaries, give have foundations, pay people, young upcoming people with talent, you know, to write music mm -hmm. and give them the money to hire people to perform it. Have free concerts, you know. Mm -hmm. They have that kind of money. They're spending it. I mean, right now with what's going, on, I guarantee you they're spending like a, a, a sickening amount of money on legal fees for the president. You know, I yeah, mean, they yeah. could, <laughs> that money could be literally musicians. I mean, you don't have to pay them that much. You could have a you could have a show and perform the you have, and perform the music. And everybody gets paid. They could have a free show because you if you're paying them from the government, they don't have to charge tickets. People could come for free. You could have people sell popcorn there, and now they're making money. I mean, it's win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. If if they would just subsidize music, that's honestly, yeah. I doubt anybody would ever take it seriously. But from a musician's life, and I know it from the inside. I've been doing this forty-seven years, and I know that the only way this business survives is off of the super popular acts. You know? Yeah, exactly. And so there's no way to really encourage people to be artistic or be esoteric. It's just like, you know, everybody wants to be the next Billie Eilish or the next Bruno Mars or, you know, the mm -hmm. next Lady Gaga or whatever. And, you know, and then you get in that lane and you say you can get 100 million streams and you're making some money. But back to your point, the difference between being a label is I give my distributor 20% hmm. of what I get. Right. And so now they still have to pay iTunes. I think iTunes takes a third. So right. if there's a dollar, iTunes takes 30 cents. They get 70, 70, whatever it is, 67 cents. Then they take off their 20% of that, hmm. which is going to be going to put me at about you know a little over 50 cents out of the dollar. Now that's I'm getting fifty percent of the dollar. Mm. Then you go to a classic record deal like Bette Midler. She was crying the blues about her streaming. I mean, I'm saying that because it was in the papers. So right. doing her streaming. Well, she's with a record label. They're going to get the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, iTunes is going to take their thirty three. So they're going to get sixty seven, and then she's going to get her you know, 8% or 10% or even 20% of that. Um, but then they're going to deduct all their costs. Right, right, right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, man. It's super crazy. You get, you get pennies on the dollar, if that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, also the I'm sure you've heard of the, the discussion about that Spotify should pay artists more, but that argument doesn't really hold up because, again, it's not Spotify paying the artist. It's the label who pays the artist. So the discussion, maybe, I mean, it would be good if Spotify could pay more per stream, of course, but the discussion should still be that the label should pay the artist more, not Spotify themselves. Here's the question. Can Spotify afford to pay more? Probably not. I don't know. Because if they can, <laughs> great. But if they can't, then don't mess up a good thing, you know? Mm. What's interesting for me is I know in my music... You know, it's interesting. I look at the statistics. My my song stream on Apple Music, 23 streams, 15 streams. You know, Deezer, three streams, whatever. On app, on Spotify, 20,000 streams. The difference between what I have on Spotify and Apple Music is uncanny. Wow. Which leads me to believe, from my point of view, leads me to believe that I think more people are using Spotify than any other streaming service. Definitely. But I also heard Apple Music pays more per stream. It's not much, but, you know, yeah, three cents maybe or something. I don't know. Maybe less than that even. Um, well, the, I, I've always been loyal to Apple because iTunes and Apple Music and, and, and they own Shazam, by the way. I don't know if you uh, knew that. I know. Yeah. It's all connected, Apple Music and Shazam. But no, I, I've always been loyal to them, and but I've got to tell you that I like Spotify, and I've been Spotify sounds good in my in my computer speakers. It's interesting. I, I was just happened to notice that. But I was listening to something. Oh, it sounds pretty good on Spotify. Whatever they're doing. Mm. You know. Yeah, I don't know actually. That's an interesting point actually. 
going to check it out. I think something interesting is that when the Napster thing came out, I mean, this is a long, you might. Yeah, 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 I remember that, yeah. <laughs> might have been very long. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing came out with Napster and MP3s and, and downloads, you know, illegal downloads. The music business got on the wrong side of that. Yeah, and yeah, definitely, man. I think, I, looking back, say that that was where the music business really took a turn downward. Mm -hmm. So I, I was trying to do these different deals with labels, with um, distribution, physical CDs, and I had sent off thousands of my CDs with this one distributor. And I remember they eventually they all came back or there was a they, the distributor went out of business. They sent whatever it was. I got boxes of stuff back and I'm going through it and there's stickers on it and there's this and that and I'm unpacking it and I'm sorting it and I'm trying, where am I going to put this? And I, at that moment I said, digital music, hmm. there's no returns, hmm. no warehousing, there's no stickers. Yeah. <laughs> I get these stickers up. There's no um, defective. There's no damaged goods. Mm -hmm. Digital. It's the perfect answer to music distribution. Definitely. They were stupid. They were just absolutely, I'm sorry to say it. They were, I mean, they were absolutely stupid. And then they were suing Napster. I mean, it was all kinds of stupid shit. They should have just immediately gone, come on, work with us. Let's exactly. all keep up together. Exactly. I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, there yeah. was a huge chance, to be honest. And as a result, I know people that have never bought music in their whole life. They yeah. don't know that you buy music. It's just something that's there. Right. They, they don't get it. And That's also an issue. Like, it's a commodity rather than something we, you know, we do enjoy. But for most part, music has become a way to sell, you know, devices or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's also a shame. Yeah, so, you know, my music started out as music that people like to watch performed. You know, that's where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. And I've had to edit it down, you know, to in, to get it to fit into, like, more standardized radio lengths and things. But if you see the performance on Saturday, you'll see where I'm coming from. It's all, my music started out as performance music. Mm. And um, so, but, you know... I myself have embraced streaming, and uh, now that I've had this little interesting accident where I found out by accident that I get better results putting songs out mm -hmm. by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now every album I put out, we put out every song from the album as a single except for one, and then when the album comes out, that one more song is on the album and all the other singles. Yeah. And the way it works, I've got it set up with iTunes. Because otherwise, it's just streaming. But with iTunes, if you buy the singles, when you buy the record, you get the credit for the singles. Right. I Because I use the same ISRC number. So it's all deliberately. We figured it all out. So, like, there's 12 songs on the record. And we do the math, too. We make it so that it's always to the benefit of the customer. There's 12 songs on the record. We released 11 of them as singles, and you've bought each one of those as a single. When you go to the buy the record, it says complete my album. Right. It, so, like, I think on my jamming outside the box, it was the I think it was record was 15 or something. And then if, and if you bought three or four of the singles or five of the singles, it says complete my album. It's like 5.99 for the album. However, it is, I have it set up that. It benefits the customers. That's awesome, man. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I just want to. I just want to reach more people. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you can do that, that's only going to benefit, yeah, the people and and you, obviously. I mean, I have to to make it really solvent. I've spent so much money on this project, so it's this outside the box project. There's jazz outside the box. There's jamming outside the box. There's box outside the box. Mm -hmm. Holiday. Outside the box, Alex Lidgewood outside the box. There's stretching outside the box. It's like this plethora of work, and I've recorded with. I mean, you think about who I've recorded with. It's crazy. I mean, I've had three of the Heartbreakers in there. I've had the Zach Brown Band. Wow. I've had uh, guys, the guys from Chicago, guys from Santana, um, guys from Jimmy Buffett's Coral Reefer, Huey Lewis's 
man, I've got Jim Keltner, Leland Scalar, you know, um, David Page, the two guys from Toto, David Page, Steve Picaro, Joseph Williams um, from Toto, uh, you know, Greg Fillingains, um, this guy, have you heard of Isaiah Sharkey? Yeah, yeah. Oh, where's he from again? Is it Snarky Puppy? No, no, no. He might have played with them. He's a, he's He plays with John Legend. Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm. He's really amazing. And then the guy, Corey, I have Corey Wong from Wolfpack. Wolfpack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zigaboo from The Meters. Bernard Purdy. I mean, it's like you go down the list of who's on the record. It's like so many, you know, the Brecker, you know, Randy Brecker, Brian Auger. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, it's almost like, almost like a whole music scene. Mm. So that's why I put all the time and money into getting everybody. Marcus Miller. Oh, yeah, cool. Steve Jordan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Vinny Calyuta. I mean, I, it's just like Michael Landau. Um, yeah, it's a good lineup. Oh, it's crazy, man. You got to have a big, big budget for that or take a lot. Well, it's been a fortune. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. I don't know that I'll ever make the money back, but I wanted to do it because it's a once in a lifetime chance. You know, I, I don't know how much longer a lot of the people are going to be around mm. and chance to go in the studio and make music together. And, and it's documented. Exactly. And the other thing was we wanted to go into some of these studios like village studio where they made the steely den Asia. And we went into Capitol records in these places that are historic with we and with historic people, and um, yeah, so that so you know I need to reach more people. I need more streams. Mm-hmm. Um, we this my goal was to go from one million to two million streams, and then my next goal will be to get to five million streams a year. You know, but right. can't force people to listen to it. Yeah, no, <laughs> have to want to. Mm. But how how do you uh, how did you reach that goal of doubling your streams from one to two million? What was the process? Well, you put out more music. Oh yeah. More music you have out, the more streams you get. Um, I work with some publicists to do publicity, and then we also advertise. We advertise on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, then tell people like in like uh, you know like when we do the concert, I'll say you know listen to us on Spotify. So it's like, it's like you have to tell people. Um, but then we also through Spotify, we're able to pitch our releases to their, their editors. Ah, cool. and, um, we've been very lucky. We've had six songs actually picked up by Spotify's editorial playlists. Hmm. It's huge. And that's a big that- playlist. Yeah. Yeah, their playlist. Like I'll give you I'll give you an example. Let me get my phone. Sure. So like, you know, the Spotify editorial playlist. Um let's see. So this one here has ninety thousand followers. Right. And so being on that has really helped, you know. Yeah, definitely. There's another one here that I got on that has 344,000 followers. Nice. So, and here's one uh, with, uh, uh, let's see. But that's, that's the, you get the idea, 100,000 followers. Um, so the key is to get on the big playlist, I guess. Yeah, and like if you can get one of the curators at at Spotify or Apple Music to like your song, pick your song, put it in a playlist, Mm -hmm. that's the bomb. But, you know, I tried to have a guy do that promotion for me, independent guy who used to work at iTunes, and it was very disappointing. He didn't, he was, he was not, um, he was not on the ball and he just kind of didn't, didn't really do it. I mean, I. You know, it's a job. It's a difficult job because you have to pitch, pitch, pitch. Mm. And then if they don't do it, then you have to say, okay, I, I tried, but nothing happened. Yeah. But we do it directly with Spotify. I don't know how to do it directly with Apple Music. That's a good question. So did, did you knew, uh, know these people or was it all just finding the email on the website and 
pitch. You're allowed through the through the Spotify artist website. You're allowed to pick one song every seven days, as long as it's never been released before. Oh uh, yeah, interesting. So they give you this chance. To, you know, this like as the but maybe maybe if you had some maybe if you were like I'm, I'm just fantasizing some big, really big shot at some label like with Billie Eilish or something. Maybe you can call Spotify yeah, or right, email. Right. Here's this. But the, for the general lower level people in this in the system of Spotify, they give you this this thing, which I which we've gotten six. We've been picked nice. up six times. Nice. Total of four playlists. What are your thoughts on the new Spotify thing, where they where you can, what is it? They promote your song if you pay them royalties. Have you seen that? You know, I applied. I I sent I sent a thing to apply for it, but I never heard back from them. Ah, is it Good. called Marquee? Don't know. Uh, but do you think that's a good thing to to pay Spotify royalties if they promote your music? Yeah, <laughs> I, it's a little. I'd have to know more about it. It's a little bit on the verge of of payola. Right. I mean, right. the way it works is ultimately people aren't going to put your stuff on a. They're not going to put your stuff on a, on a curated list unless it's good. Yeah. They think it's good. That's the other thing. It's all subjective. <coughs> Remember, nobody wanted to sign the Beatles. You know, it's all very <laughs> subjective. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Here's a great story for you. Do you know the Peanuts theme? This Peanuts theme? No. It's a, it's a, dun, 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 dun. It's the theme for Peanuts. It's been around for 50 years. Right. It's every Christmas. It's, you've never heard, you're not familiar I haven't heard about it. Maybe it's just in the U.S., maybe. Well, it's, no, it's, it's just something from my lifetime. I'm going to play you. Sure. Um, <laughs> because, um, Uh, there's a story about this, which is really cool. Uh, okay. Get to the... Uh, go on Apple Music. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, this is a very famous song, but maybe not to everybody. Uh, okay. I think they... They call it Linus... Call it Linus and Lucy. I don't think I've ever heard it, actually. So you haven't watched the Charlie Brown Christmas special? No, 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 I haven't. <laughs> This song is so famous. I, went, I bet you the, the, the plays on Spotify is, you know, 100 million or something. Right, right, right. So here's the thing about it. It's done by a jazz pianist, Vince Guaraldi. It was done in the 60s. So it's a jazz trio, kind of a jazzy sound. So what happened was in the back in the day, they were going to do a Peanuts special on TV, a Peanuts Christmas special. It was live TV in New York. They wanted a jazz piano, so they approached Dave Brubeck. They wanted Dave Brubeck to do the music for the Peanuts, you know, because in the show, well, there was a guy that played piano in the Peanuts, one of the characters. So they, they go to Dave Brubeck, and he's too busy. No, I can't do that. And that was another thing. In those days, People didn't do stuff like that. It's like, I'm an artist. I play my music. I play my concerts. I'm not going to do music for, for kids' cartoons. Right. Because people, it wasn't so money-oriented. People didn't do things about the money. But now, it'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then, they went to this other guy. He recommended Danny Zeitlin, who was another jazz pianist in San Francisco at the time, who was quite good, you know. And then, oh, no, I, I'm not into that, man. I'm too busy. So they went to the third guy. He recommended Vince Guaraldi, who played up in San Francisco with this trio. Vince Guaraldi trio, you know, and they went to Vince Guaraldi and they said, sure, I'll do it. He made the deal. He did the music and they were like, the way the music came down, it was all the last minute. They were in New York. They were going live with the special and the music was being couriered across the country, the, the, the master reels of tape and they're waiting for it and they're waiting for it and they're like, you know, it's like 30 minutes before showtime or 45 minutes, but where's that music? It shows up and they put the music on and the, the big producer guy at the head listens to it and he goes, I hate that. I hate that. The worst shit I've ever heard. I never want to work with that guy again, ever. 
Right. And they, they played the show, but they had no choice, so they ran the show with that music. That music is so fucking popular. That's the irony, because right. it that music, when people, other than you, people hear that music and they go, Charlie Brown, Peanuts. Well, it's, maybe it's, it's something that we've seen on the TV, but... I mean, the story is, it's so subjective, you know. Mm. I guarantee you that that producer ended up liking Vince Caroli after that. Right, 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 right. I mean, yeah, that's funny, man, how it can go go sometimes. You know, it's, like you said, it's, it's super subjective. Um, yeah. So, and so, you know, if you want, so you go to a Spotify playlist, you send it to the, you know, they listen, they, you know, they oh, we're not interested, we're not interested. And it's like, well, you can't really go back and say, listen again. I mean, it's an interesting rhythm. So the key is to just keep making music, mm. which is what I've done. I, I started putting my first record in 1983. Mm. And um, when I go on to um, um, iTunes, I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, two, three, four, five, about six rows of ten. I, I've, does that mean I've got almost 600 products now? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> but I'd say I have a good five hundred. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's a that's a great you know tip I guess whatever you want to call it. Just keep making music. Yeah. And that's it. Keep making music. Keep trying, putting it out there, and keep telling people. That's the other thing. You know, people have to know about it. You know. That's why we're doing the interview. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. why it's very important. I was out shopping. I was doing an errand, and I said, I need to run. I need to get home and be on this call on time. This is very important. Hmm. And I appreciate you taking time. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. You know. I really appreciate you taking your time, actually. So it goes both ways, I guess. And it'll get more people to know about. All they have to do is put David Garfield into Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, Tidal, whatever you got, Amazon. YouTube music and put it in. We've got a lot of cool videos up at Creechy Records on YouTube. We have beautiful stuff up there. And, uh, you know, the show this Saturday, 3 p.m. in Los Angeles time is going to be on my davidgarfield.com will be the links. Awesome. Man. Free show. And just keep out. doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, awesome, David. Do you, I mean, before we wrap up, do you. I mean, you did already say it, but where else can um, people find you beyond Chesky Records and, oh, sorry, Creature Records? Uh, do you have a Facebook page? Do you have your own? Stuff? Yes. Yeah, everything Everything is linked on uh, on my website, davidgarfield.com, are the links to all my socials. I have Facebook, um, Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, you know, Twitter, all that stuff. But I mainly put stuff up on Facebook and I do a lot on YouTube, you know. Right, right, right. There's a lot of stuff on SoundCloud, Creechy Records on SoundCloud. There's a lot you can hear there for free. Right. And that's on YouTube. It's also under Creechy Records then, I guess. Or Exactly. Yeah. Creechy Records on YouTube. And there's some cool videos up there I've been collecting from uh, my, me playing with other people cool. like at Mont Jazz or Carnegie Hall, wherever. Awesome, man. Well, David, it was yeah. a pleasure. And uh, yeah, don't forget to say hello to JJ from me if you see him. I will. <laughs> and yeah, thank you for for spending this hour with me. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. 